Get ready, everyone, because we're diving into a fascinating world today, um, exploring some pretty unexpected links between math, emotions, energy, and even information theory. You've definitely given us a lot to unpack this time. It is truly remarkable how these, what seem like totally different concepts, all intertwine. Yeah. Our mission today is to kind of unravel those connections, see what insights we can uncover together. So let's kick things off with something that, to be honest, I never really considered before, the idea that math can actually represent, you know, our emotional states. Okay. And I'm not talking about just like rating our stress level on a scale of one to 10. We're talking about representing emotions with actual mathematical functions. Precisely. One of your sources dives into using what's called the logistic map equation, the concept from chaos theory to model anxiety. The logistic map. OK, yeah. that's the one that can generate those wild, unpredictable graphs. Right? right. That's the one. The source suggests that the chaotic ups and downs of those graphs, they mirror the fluctuating nature of anxiety. Just like those values can swing back and forth, our anxiety levels can act in a kind of unpredictable way. So instead of just saying, I'm feeling anxious, we could potentially like visualize our anxiety on a graph using this equation. Exactly. It provides a visual representation of the ebb and flow of, of anxiety. Of course, it's a simplified model, but it highlights how even our seemingly chaotic emotions mm. um, might have these underlying patterns and structures. Mm. And those structures, importantly, can be represented through mathematics. That's pretty amazing. It's like math isn't just this cold, abstract system. It has the potential to like reflect yeah. our inner experiences, you know. Absolutely. But it gets even more interesting. The source mentions that if you introduce a damping factor to the logistic map equation, things start to settle down. Yes, that damping factor acts as a, a stabilizing force. So instead of those wild swings, the values gradually reach a state of equilibrium, similar to how, like, we might use calming techniques to manage and reduce anxiety. So you can actually use math to not only visualize your anxiety, but also to see how calming techniques might impact it. That's a pretty powerful concept. It is, isn't it? And that leads us to another fascination concept, the, the idea of viewing mathematical equations as energy systems. Okay, now we're getting into some seriously mind-bending territory. We're talking about equations themselves having energy. That's precisely what the source proposes. It suggests that equations can be seen as starting with a burst of get this eternal energy which then gradually dissipates over time. Eternal energy in an equation. Okay, can you give me a concrete example of what that might look like? Let's let's stick with the anxiety analogy. Think of the initial burst of energy in the equation as representing that sudden surge of anxiety. As time progresses with the influence of the damping factor, that initial energy is transformed, dissipated, perhaps even converted into a different form that represents a calmer, more stable state. So it's like the initial chaotic energy of anxiety gradually transforms into a more organized, less erratic form of energy. Precisely. It's a different way of visualizing how, even within this mathematical framework, there's this concept of energy transformation, even dissipation taking place. It's almost as if, even in the abstract world of math, you can't escape the fundamental laws of physics, like, you know, energy conservation. Exactly. And this concept of energy and transformation in math surprisingly connects to information theory. Okay, well, hold on. We're jumping from emotions and energy straight into information theory. I'm intrigued to see how this all ties together. They're ready for a fascinating journey. This is where Claude Shannon and his groundbreaking work enter the picture. Oh, Claude Shannon, the father of information theory. Didn't he say something about knowing the past but not controlling it, and then controlling the future but not knowing it? He did. But before we delve into that, let's explore how information theory fits into this puzzle of energy and transformation. Shannon introduced the concept of what he called information entropy, which um, essentially measures the uncertainty or randomness in a set of possible outcomes. So how does this concept of randomness in information relate back to energy? That's where it gets incredibly interesting. The mathematical formulas used to describe entropy in information theory are strikingly similar to those used to describe entropy in thermodynamics, you know, the branch of physics that deals with heat and energy. Wait, are you saying that there's a connection between the randomness of information and something like how heat spreads out in a room? You're catching on. In physics, entropy often refers to the level of disorder or randomness in a system. The more entropy, the higher the disorder. Imagine a really messy room that's a high entropy state. So a perfectly organized, tidy room would have low entropy. Precisely. 
And just like energy tends to disperse, leading to increased disorder, information can also lose clarity and become more uncertain as it's transmitted or processed. So encountering static or interference in a phone call would be like heat increasing the entropy in a room, making it harder to hear the person on the other end. That's a great analogy. Just like heat spreading through a room disrupts order, noise disrupts the clear transmission of information. It creates uncertainty, making it harder to decipher the original message. This is incredible. So you're suggesting that information itself can be viewed as a form of energy that can like transform and even dissipate? That's the intriguing idea the source presents. It suggests that information isn't static, it's dynamic and subject to the same kinds of transformations and potential degradation we see with energy in the physical world. So when we send a message, it's like sending a burst of information energy. And uh, just like energy, that information can lose its clarity along the way due to various forms of noise. Exactly. And that brings us back to Claude Shannon's insightful quote about the past and future. Remember what it was. Something like, we may have knowledge of the past, but cannot control it. We may control the future, but have no knowledge of it. How does that connect to what we're discussing? It emphasizes the irreversible nature of both information and energy flow. This is getting really interesting. Go on. Well, in the context of information, the past, which represents the information we've already received and processed, is a state of lower entropy. We have knowledge of it, but we can't change it. Just like we can't undo the dissipation of energy that's already happened. It's like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. Once something's been transformed, you can't perfectly reverse it. Exactly. And on the other hand, the future, with all its possibilities and unknowns, represents a state of higher entropy. Because we lack knowledge of what will happen, countless possibilities could unfold. Precisely. And while our choices influence the future, like, say, choosing a reliable messaging app with strong error correction to combat noise, we can never fully predict or control how that information will be received, or how those events will ultimately play out. Wow, this is a lot to take in, but I'm starting to see the connections here. Understanding information entropy could give us a whole new perspective on how we approach communication, learning, even navigating the world around us. It's like you're giving me a new lens through which to view reality. It's fascinating to consider, isn't it? Just as understanding energy and its transformations is fundamental to physics, grasping information entropy and its implications is crucial in our increasingly information-saturated world. It seems like we've only just scratched the surface. What other fascinating connections are we going to uncover as we delve deeper into this topic? You're right. We've only just begun to explore this fascinating relationship between information and energy. And... Um, this leads us to another really compelling idea from your sources, the analogy of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform, okay, I'll be honest, that one rings a bell, but I might need a little bit of a refresher. Doesn't that have something to do with breaking down signals into their individual frequencies? You're exactly right. In simple terms, the Fourier transform takes a signal that's spread out over time, and uh, it reveals its hidden structure in terms of frequencies. Imagine like listening to a symphony orchestra. Okay, yeah, I can picture that. Now imagine trying to understand the symphony by like listening to each instrument individually. Oh, great. It would be a jumble of sounds. Yeah, for sure. The Fourier transform is like having the musical score in front of you. It shows you how all those individual th frequencies, those instruments, all combine to create that full, beautiful complexity of the music. So how does this musical analogy relate to information theory and energy? That's where it gets really fascinating. Your source suggests that we can think of the initial signal, the one before the Fourier transform, as representing the raw energy of information. Think of it like a raw message, right, before it's been analyzed or broken down in any way. So it's full of potential information, but we haven't extracted any meaningful patterns or insights from it yet. Exactly. Then, when we apply the Fourier transform, we're essentially transforming that raw energy, that initial message, into its frequency components. And those components, as your source points out, are the actual information we're trying to understand. So it's like the Fourier transform takes this messy wave of potential information and, um, I don't know, it reorganizes it, reveals a hidden order within what seemed like chaos. Precisely. It's similar to, like, if you had a room full of seemingly random objects and then you organize them into categories. Right. Suddenly you can see the relationships between things, the underlying structure that was hidden before. 
That's essentially what the Fourier transform does with information. It helps us understand how the information is structured by showing us how its energy is distributed across those different frequencies. Okay, I'm starting to see the parallels here. So the raw signal, the message before the Fourier transform, is like raw, unprocessed energy. And then the frequency domain, after applying the transform, is where we actually start to perceive meaningful information. You got it. Yeah. And just like energy can be lost during transformations in the physical world, information can become less clear, more entropic, you could say, as it's transmitted or processed. Remember those noisy phone calls we talked about? Definitely. Well, that noise in a communication channel is analogous to friction in a physical system. It leads to a dissipation of energy or in this case, a degradation of the information being transmitted. So a clearer signal is like encountering less friction and more of that initial information energy reaches its destination intact. Exactly. The more noise or interference there is, the more that information energy is spread out, making it harder to recover that original message. That makes perfect sense. So if information is this form of energy that can be transformed, what does that mean for how we approach things like communication or learning? It's a profound question with implications for really countless fields. One key takeaway is that we need to be much more aware of the role of noise and entropy in our lives. Just as you know, engineers strive to reduce energy loss in their designs, we should be aiming to minimize information loss in our communication and our learning processes. Could you give me an example of what that might look like in a practical sense? Absolutely. Think about all the distractions we encounter every day, uh, the misunderstandings that come up in conversations, even the inherent limitations of language itself. These all contribute to information entropy, making it harder to convey and receive information clearly. It's like trying to have a conversation in a crowded, noisy room. All that background noise acts as friction, making it harder to actually understand each other. Precisely. Just as engineers have developed methods for transmitting energy with minimal loss, think high voltage power lines or fiber optic cables, we can apply similar principles to how we communicate. We can strive for clarity in our language, structure our messages carefully, and be mindful of potential distractions or sources of noise that might interfere with that clear transmission. It's fascinating how these concepts from physics and information theory can offer such practical insights into our daily lives. It really highlights the interconnectedness of knowledge. But what's even more fascinating is how these ideas extend even further, even touching upon the realm of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. Now we're really going down the rabbit hole. Okay, I'm ready, though. Tell me more. Quantum mechanics and information theory, two things I honestly never thought I'd be connecting. What's the link between these, what seem like totally different worlds? Well, one of the most kind of mind-blowing aspects of quantum mechanics is how it challenges our very understanding of information. You see, in the quantum realm, information isn't just a passive observer, it actually shapes reality itself. Okay, that sounds intriguing, but you're going to have to break that down for me. How can information actually shape reality? In quantum mechanics particles, they don't exist in a definite state until they're observed. Before that, they exist in what's called a superposition of states, meaning they have the potential to be in multiple states simultaneously. It's like, um... Imagine a coin spinning in the air. It's neither heads nor tails until the moment it lands and you see it. Right, precisely. And here's where information comes into play. The act of observing a quantum system, the very act of extracting information from it, forces it to kind of choose a single state from those multiple possibilities. It's like our observation collapses what's called the wave function, mm. causing the superposition to collapse into one definite outcome. So instead of information just being something we gain through observation, you're saying it's actually like a force that influences the outcome of the observation itself. Exactly. It's a pretty profound concept, isn't it? In the quantum world, information isn't just a reflection of reality. It actively participates in shaping that reality as we experience it. That's incredible. But how does this tie back to our earlier discussion about information as a form of energy? Well, your source touches on a mind-bending concept in quantum mechanics called quantum entanglement. And this really highlights this connection. Entanglement. Okay, that's where two particles become linked, even if they're like light years apart, right? It's like they have this invisible connection where if you measure the state of one, you instantly know the state of the other one, no matter how far apart they are. That's a great way to put it. And what's really incredible is that this entanglement, it seems to operate outside of our conventional understanding of energy and information transfer. 
because it happens instantaneously, right? Defying the speed of light, which is supposed to be like the ultimate speed limit in the universe. Exactly. This instantaneous connection has led some physicists to propose that entanglement might involve a form of information exchange that doesn't rely on, like, our traditional energy or information carriers. So it's like entangled particles have tapped into some secret communication channel, bypassing the usual rules of the universe, allowing them to share information instantly across vast distances. It's a captivating thought, and while we're still a long way from fully comprehending entanglement, it prompts us to kind of reconsider our fundamental understanding of information, of energy, perhaps even the nature of reality itself. This whole deep dive has been honestly a mind-bending journey. We started with like connecting math to our own emotions, then we explored how information behaves like energy, and now we're here contemplating the mysteries of quantum entanglement. It's amazing how these seemingly separate disciplines, when examined together, can illuminate such profound connections. It definitely underscores that the more we learn, the more we realize how much more there is to discover. So to our listeners out there, we leave you with this. Keep questioning, keep exploring, and never underestimate that power of information. Who knows what other incredible connections are out there waiting to be uncovered.